Hi everyone, what we're going to be doing today is introducing Unit 2, and Unit 2 covers culture, language, and religion. Um, for culture, we're going to cover both AMSCO Chapter 6 as well as Rubenstein Chapter 4. In these chapters, um, we will explore lots of different concepts of culture. Um, and the most important thing for you to understand is diffusion of culture, the sharing of cultural ideas, um, and understanding differences in, uh, across the globe, okay? as well as connections. You always want to be able to make connections. So you are to read Chapter 6 in AMSCO, and this is an overview of concepts of culture as well as the diffusion of culture. So one of the key things in understanding culture is to know that a culture complex is the combination of all the different cultural traits. Okay, so it's the combination of what you eat, how you dress, the type of housing you live in, um, the type of communities you have, uh, your cultural celebrations, things like that. All of that together is your culture complex. And so, especially with folk cultures, we have this sense of place. And you need to understand that sense of place is this knowing that you are in a particular area. For example, a sense of place, when you hear y'all, you hear, Do you, would you like a Coke? Um, you know, you know you're in the South. You know, versus being in the North where you may hear something like soda pop, okay? So the sense of place is an idea of being in a particular location and the behaviors and habits of the people there create a sense of place. So when we talk about culture, we have had lots of different mixing of cultures. And so that has been a result of diffusion. A lot of Things are diffused today through the media, um, but there have also been relocation diffusion. And so the diffusion of these ideas has changed the sense of place. So whereas in the past, a southern small little town may have had a main street and had certain types of stores, but now as you drive through a small town along the interstate, you still see the exits for McDonald's, Wendy's, an Exxon gas station, what have you. And so with diffusion, um, you have also kind of lost the uniqueness. Popular culture has also played a role in this. So we're gonna be comparing folk culture with popular culture in this unit and are specifically in the, these particular chapters, chapter six and chapter four. Uh, but popular culture is gonna entail things such as McDonald's or a Starbucks. And with this, um, you know, mainstream type brands, you lose a distinctive feeling for locations. So you don't necessarily know if you're in Baton Rouge or if you're in New Orleans or if you're in Shreveport, you can still go to these same types of stores as you travel along the interstate. The term cultural landscape is essential to this course and we will refer to it throughout the entire year. It is the visual representation of a culture or the built environment. So how we as humans have interacted with the earth, that is gonna be our cultural landscape. Um, and how have we made it ours? So it's gonna change from country to country, from location to location, from group to group, okay? So in the US, we may have national parks, um, and in Quebec, they may have bilingual signs. Uh, we may have um, different types of schools in the south than we do in the north of the United States. Um, you have massive skyscrapers in Shanghai, um, and then you have segregated schools in Pakistan, and that is reflective of their cultural norms. So again, cultural landscape is very, very important to our class. 
So um, here, in, they talk about the 10 culture, major cultural realms in um, the AMSCO book, and that is important. You do need to have an idea of these. I'm not going to ask you to repeat them, like to memorize them, but you just need to be um, cognizant of these because some of these terms come up again. So you have the Anglo-American here, North America mainly. You have Latin America, that includes Central America and South America. Um, you have the Islamic, which here is Northern Africa, and then you have the Middle East, and then up here in some of Central Asia. Um, you have Sub-Saharan Africa, that's a different cultural realm. You have the European realm. You have the Slavic realm. Um, and then you have the Sino-Japanese realm, you have the Indian realm, uh, then the Southeast Asia, as well as the Austral-European. So those realms are just important because sometimes those FRQs will refer to different realms. Diffusion is a basic term that we had talked about uh, in Chapter 1, in Unit 1, and so here in Cultural Diffusion, we're going to um, break it down a little bit more and we're going to talk about two types of cultural diffusion one being relocation diffusion and then the second being expansion diffusion and what we mean by this cultural diffusion is we're spreading the cultural traits from one group to another all right so it's this movement of cultural innovations um, or ideas from the hearth to a new area. Remember the hearth is where an idea or innovation starts and then spreads from there. So the relocation diffusion is pretty simple. You move from one place to another, you bring with it all your cultural traits, your beliefs, your practices, etc. Expansion diffusion is going to be a little different because we're going to have three different categories of expansion diffusion. And those are going to be hierarchical, stimulus, and contagious. So we're going to go over some of those details briefly, but the differences between those, but we will focus more on more specific examples when we get into Rubenstein. But for all of these um, forms of diffusion, we have to keep in, the, keep in mind globalization. So globalization is definitely going to be one of those ways that popular culture is spread. Um, it also can affect folk culture negatively and again we'll talk more about that later but um, some of the means of um, introducing popular culture across the globe would be things such as movies um, the television is a major um, influence internet of course and um, political reach also plays a role whenever we are talking about popular culture so in your reading notes, I asked you to compare hierarchical diffusion with reverse hierarchical diffusion. And hierarchical diffusion is going to be top to bottom diffusion. So someone in power, whether it is a famous person, whether it is a politician, um, or you know some important organization, um, they have an idea and it trickles down to the normal, common, everyday people, right? So let's say Kanye West comes out with this great new style, he just signed a deal with Gap, and so everyone starts wearing his Gap clothes because it's Kanye West, right? So that's hierarchical diffusion. Reverse hierarchical diffusion is going to be a little bit different. For reverse hierarchical diffusion, you're going to have someone like necessary, just like a regular everyday person, someone in um, maybe a rural area starts having these butterfly tattoos. These butterfly tattoos, um, they go viral, so then everyone decides to get a butterfly tattoo. So that's reverse hierarchical diffusion, okay? So stimulus diffusion is also important because it, it is an idea that maybe is used in multiple locations but it's not used in the same ways. So I always give the example of the iPhone. So the iPhone was this great, wonderful touchscreen phone, but who could really afford an iPhone? Um, especially now, right? They're so expensive. So Samsung competes with that and they provide something that is similar to the iPhone but it doesn't have the same name brand, right? So that is called stimulus diffusion. So the last question I leave you with on the reading notes is, has multiculturalism been successful? 
And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, and I think the book kind of leaves you with that it kind of has, but it kind of hasn't been. Um, so there's still prejudice and discrimination in the United States. Um, we do have places, little Chinatowns. We have little Italy's. Um, and those are ethnic enclaves, which are, you know, do reflect multiculturalism, but not necessarily acceptance, okay? Um, but, you know, this debate of the melting pot or the tall salad for the U.S. has been going on for a really long time, um, and I'm sure one day we could debate about this, um, but I think it's a mixture of both. That's my opinion, but, you know, you may have a different opinion, which is perfectly fine. I would like to end the lecture um, going over the questions at the end of the chapter. So the first one gives you a photo of an auto or a drawing of an automobile and asks you, according to the cultural complex described in the diagram, auto ownership provides transportation but also, and the answer would be A, represents a set of American cultural traits such as self-reliance and in independence because you can now drive, go where you want to go. Um, of course, your parents probably keep GPS on you, which is really smart, um, but it is still independence. All right, for number two, it asks, which of the following best demonstrates the concept of a cultural hearth? And the answer is going to be C, the places in the world where material and non-material traits emerged. Okay, remember that hearth is the idea, is the area where ideas developed and then uh, diffused from there. Number three, ask um, which pattern is more typical of folk cultures than other, type, than other types of cultures? And it's going to be D. It's going to emphasize the value of tradition, right? If you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof, it's tradition, right? Um, so folk cultures is definitely focused on tradition and doing the same thing year after year. All right, um, number four, the various cultural regions that compose the United States demonstrate how A, various cultural regions share some values yet remain distinct. And then number five, the onion doomed churches in Moscow are most clearly examples of that city's cultural D, landscape. And then number six, a family of immigra immigrants from China to the U.S. chooses to live in an ethnic enclave is probably hoping to C. Find a buffer against discrimination while they seek new opportunities. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the year, but these ethnic enclaves definitely offer not only a cultural and a language, um, you know, security, but also financial security as well as people move to the United States or whatever country they happen to be in. Enclaves exist all over the world. Um, for number seven, which of the information would be most useful to a geographer trying to identify the borders of cultural regions that each cover hundreds of square miles within a large country? And it would be D, the sites travelers see as they travel along major highways across the country. And number eight, one effect of the spread of popular culture through globalization is that B, several traits have become part of the worldwide culture. And I hope this lecture is helpful. Um, the next uh, lecture will be covering chapter four of Rubenstein. Thank you for listening.